Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending our education book discussion today with Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott. We're really excited that you're here. Um, I see participants starting to come in, so we're going to get started right away. I'm Jenna Robinson, president of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. The Martin Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to higher education reform. We advocate responsible governance, viewpoint diversity, academic quality, cost-effective education solutions, and innovative market-based reform. You can find more at jamesgmartin.center. The Martin Center's education book discussions are quarterly online events with authors of recent or sort of recent books about higher education or related topics. Past discussions have included varied topics, including intellectual humility, the importance of beauty in higher education, racial preferences, and critical race theory. I'm thrilled that we can bring you what I'm sure will be a great discussion today about the canceling of the American mind, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. Thank you to our viewers and donors for making events like this possible. Although this event is free, we appreciate those of you who made voluntary contributions. Your support fuels everything we do. I'll hand the floor over to Greg and Ricky shortly, but I wanted to take one minute to tell you how this event will run. First, our two authors will talk for about 20 minutes about their book. Then my colleague, George Leaf, will join Greg and Ricky for a short discussion. At around 3.15, George will start posing questions from the audience. Viewers, you can pose a question by using the Q&A icon at any time. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and George will read those questions to our panelists at the end of the discussion. If you're viewing on Facebook, simply post your questions in the comments section, and we'll be sure to monitor those as well. Also, we are recording this event, so you can watch it later or share it online. Now to introduce our guests. Greg Lukianoff is an attorney, author, and the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, FIRE. In addition to the book we're discussing today, Greg has also written Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate, Freedom from Speech, and The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure with his co-author, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Greg is also an executive producer of Can We Take a Joke and of Mighty Ira, A Civil Liberties Story. Ricky Schlott is a New York City-based journalist and a political commentator. She is a research fellow at FIRE, host of the Lost Debate podcast, a columnist at the New York Post, and a regular contributor to no numerous publications and television programs. Her commentary focuses on free speech, campus culture, civil liberties, and youth issues from a Generation Z perspective. Welcome, Greg and Ricky, and take it away. So uh, Ricky and I decided to divvy up. Um, oh, first of all, I wish I could see this up. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Always great to see you, George. Thank you so much to the Martin Center um, for, for having us um, and for all the work that went into this. Thank you, Jenna, um, for, uh, for having us. And uh, Ricky and I decided to divvy up the discussion of the book into roughly the thirds that it's broken into. Um, first, talking about the problem um, and what we're seeing both on and off campus. Uh, I'm going to hop in more for the uh, rhetorical fortress discussion, which is more part two about how this shows the sorry way that we tend to debate these days. Um, and then we'll probably work together on the final section, uh, the final third of the book, which is about... Um, potential solutions and also some interesting stories about how this has hit journalism, publishing, et cetera. So um, take it away, Ricky. Yeah. Um, so first, just a little bit of the the genesis of the book. Um, originally, Greg and I had planned to write more of a follow-up to The Coddling of the American Mind in a more direct sense, um, particularly because that book touched so much on issues of Gen Z. And it was um, something that I had read as a freshman in college at NYU, and it really resonated with me. Um, but in the process of heading towards uh, that original book ideal, we realized that people were still saying that cancel culture did not exist. Um, and that claim just like simply flies in the face of all the research that um, everyone at FIRE was doing, all the, the 
tremendous caseloads that poured in during 2020 and also my own experience having been on campuses um, in the very recent past. And so we decided to kind of pivot to um, the canceling of the American mind here. And one thing that we both realized pretty early on is that both of us dislike the term cancel culture. It's um, we think it's definitely been politically charged and abused in a way that um, is sometimes unfortunate, but that it's important to to keep people in the cultural conversation and not to over intellectualize a term that is no longer recognizable to the typical everyday person. And since 80% of the American public recognizes what cancel culture is and knows that term, um, we decided to lean into it pretty full tilt with our title to say the least. Um, and we open our book with the case study of Hamline University where a professor um, was showing a, a, a painting of the prophet Muhammad in a class um, that was a painting commissioned by a Muslim king and painted by a Muslim artist um, in the medieval times. And this teacher, this professor had multiple times warned students that this was going to be part of the content. Of course, um, in the Islamic faith, it can be considered sacrilegious. And multiple times on the syllabus, um, in person, in the class, gave people day of the excuse to, to, to leave class if they were no longer comfortable, et cetera. And yet this teacher or professor ended up being absolutely torn down by a student who retrospectively said that they were offended by having seen the image. Um, and the university president in a pretty spectacular display effectively said that her academic freedom was um, secondary to the student's right to feel comfortable. Uh, she was not renewed for her contract for the following semester. And it was just such a spectacular display of, of cancel culture in a, in a way that it just, regardless of people's politics, it seemed to just generally be condemned, um, which is unique because typically cancel culture cases tend to take one side championing uh, the person being attacked just based on their politics. But this was a, a kind of heartening moment, I think, for both Greg and I to see that pretty much across the board, people were recognizing that this was a violation of academic freedom. Um, and so we think that that's just kind of an illustrative case study. And obviously, um, in the wake of 2020, there's just numerous um, case studies that we have been able to pile throughout the book, uh, particularly what's happening on campus. And we go back and rewind through Greg's experience um, at of being at FIRE for more than 20 years and of fighting the fight on campus um, and the tremendous statistics and data that everyone and researchers at FIRE were able to compile for us about how the caseloads are just going up year over year over year and exploded spectacularly in 2020. Um, and then we we also turn to the modern university campus um, to discuss how campuses are still ground zero. Um, and that kind of draws a bit from my own experience at NYU and um, definitely growing up in a, an era where censorship was pervasive um, and where self-censoring was just pretty much the status quo, at least in my experience on campus. Um, and so that's generally the, the first chunk of the book. I'll let Greg uh, get to the, the second chapter or second portion, which is about how cancel culture works. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, yeah, and a little bit more about the um, uh, uh, telling a little bit more of the story of, the, of how this came to be. Um, we heard pretty fast. Uh, we try to always be on the lookout for talent at FIRE. And it got back to me pretty fast from a number, actually multiple different people at FIRE, that there was this new, like super young journalist who was just killing it at both Reason um, and uh, the New York Post. <laughs> Um, and that we should try to, you know, get her as a fellow as soon as we could. I think this might have been before I even talked to you, Ricky. Um, she became a fellow. We worked together for about a year, and she has this amazing ability to, you know, hasn't never been to law school, and I could send her, you know, um, 50, 60 pages of stuff that included a fair amount of law, and she could boil it down to, you know, 2,000 words and not miss any of the nuance in it, which is just not something that, you know, most adults and most lawyers can do. So um, that's, uh, I was really, it was really great to get to write with her. Um, so, at, and the process of working on the book, um, I actually, and the, 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 in many ways, Ricky's more mature than I am, I found it like, incredibly depressing um, during it, and really kind of disheartening about like, how bad it made the whole situation 
uh, look. Um, and uh, but there's a little little light at the end of the tunnel. Whereas when the book came out, it came out right around the time of October seventh, um, and. I think that although you know there, it's hard to say that there's a bright side to October seventh because it's just a horrifying attack. Um, one good thing that Bill Maher also agreed with us on is that we run into it's only the crazies now who are saying that there's nothing wrong in higher education. Um, I think this was really a slap in the face that the whole rest of the country needed, and I feel like it couldn't have been brought home just by our book. Um, it had to, people had to see it really writ large. So part two um, is, well, I think, probably one of the, uh, if you think you know a lot about cancel culture and you've read some books on it, um, you, you know, you might be familiar with a lot of the stories that Ricky and I talk about. There are going to be a lot that we know you're not going to be because we did, you know, there are a lot of cases that aren't all that well known that we covered as well. Um, but the part where we get to be a little bit more creative is talk about what we call rhetorical fortresses. Um, and this is the idea that both on the right and the left, although cancel culture is more a problem on the left, it still, we, we call it out when it's on the right as well, because we're, you know, genuinely, fire is a generally nonpartisan organization, and that's what, you know, principled people do. Um, but what we mean by rhetorical fortresses is the way that people insulate, protect their argument for ever having to be, to fight on fair ground. Um, that where essentially uh, there are all these uh, ways that you prevent someone from ever actually getting to the substance of the other person's argument. And we go through uh, the, the, the tactics that both sides use first, and we call the first one um, the obstacle course. So I basically pictured it like the no man's land in World War I. You know, first you'd have the barbed wire, then you'd have the minefield, then you'd have the trenches, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and so the obstacle course are essentially pretty, pretty, pretty much um, the entire list of uh, logical fallacies. I'm actually pointing into that. You can see it. I have a poster of logical fallacies on on on, on my wall. You know, just to remind me of what they all are. Um, and large logical fallacies are, of course, things that uh, you know every everybody uses. And of course, among them is ad, ad hominem, which is the one that repeats over and over again throughout the book, you know, um, that, that essentially uh, arguing about the person, not the substance, um, is, is a rule rather than the uh, exception, unfortunately, today. Um, and uh, so we point to a, a lot of the more standard arguments um, that are just uh, like straw manning, for example, um, because straw manning is something that I see people uh, do all over the spectrum. I, I now have a um, substack called The Eternally Radical Idea, we just addressed a review done by the legal director of the ACLU, um, David Cole, who, by the way, I want to be very clear, I have tremendous respect for and actually like quite a bit as a person. And this was in the New York Review of Books. Um, but he straw mans a couple of our arguments. Like he, he pretends that we made easier arguments to knock down than we actually did. Like, for example, he points out um, that we're saying... Uh, uh, we're engaging in rhetorical excess because we're saying that cancel culture is worth worse than McCarthyism. And I point out, well, no, we're actually much more specific about it. We're, we're saying that more people have been fired under cancel culture than under McCarthyism. And that's just a fact. And so I, I spent about 3,500 words addressing all of these different, um, mostly straw man arguments that David Cole made. The next stage is what we call the minefield. And those are the ones where uh, they're, they're digging down more into ad hominem and getting into the kind of tactics that are used more in the age of social media that is overwhelmingly about getting at the person. Um, and here we made up some fun new terms like hip um, hypocrisy projection. And this is something that I uh, this uh, I feel like this term needs to be in public uh, better. Um, or uh, because you see this, if you're on social media, you'll see this all the time. Um, and if you're familiar with FIRE, you've probably seen someone, you know, possibly in all caps writing when someone on the uh, uh, um, on the left gets in trouble or on, for that matter, on the right gets in trouble, someone writing, well, where is FIRE on this case? Um, and of course, what's happened time and time again is that we're literally quoted in the article that they're sending around. Like or the the newspaper knows about the case because of our press release. Um, like if they'd done any minimal research, they would have discovered that not only do we know about it, we're already involved in it, and we're actually why you know about it as well. My my, my favorite example of this one was uh, someone actually where is fire on this one? Uh, other than the one where we were quoted like two inches down, which actually happened multiple times. Someone was sending around some a, a legal document that was 
that you could read was actually something that was only available thanks to our legal team um, asking where we were on this particular case. So, um, and the hypocrisy projection comes from the idea that since we have uh, uh, characters of who our intellectual opponents are and they have to be evil, and since evil means you have to be wrong, um, that uh, and since people really believe this, of course my opponents ha um, have to be hypocrites. Now, of course, ad hominem and hypocrisy, um, this gets at what we call the fourth great untruth in the book, which is that no uh, no bad person has any good opinions. We put it, I put it a little differently than we say in the book, um, because if you'll notice, a lot of the way we argue on social media is just to establish that someone else is bad and we're trying to make the argument and then you, therefore you don't have to listen to them. And I always like to point out, you know, it's really clear that Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Karl Marx were awful people. You know, um, Marx was a raging anti-Semite um, racist. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, don't even get me started on what a horrible person he was. Um, that doesn't mean they're wrong. <laughs> I honestly think they're wrong for other reasons, but you know, some of the stuff on Rousseau's, um, you know, opinion on child rearing, for example, I think there's actually a lot of validity to it. His general will thing, horrifying. Um, but we argue as if just establishing that someone's bad is the same way of saying they're wrong. And we're saying like, that's the first step that we do that, that, that is, that is BS. Um, so we get through those those true techniques with some special shout outs for NPRs on the media, which is like the king of straw manning First Amendment arguments, um, if you've ever been able to tune into it. Um, then we get to the ones that are particular to the different sides of the political spectrum. The first one is the efficient rhetorical fortress, which is the one that we talk about on the right, where you can dismiss anybody that you can label woke, liberal, lefty, etc. And I say, and I emphasize label because that's, we don't argue as if, oh, I have verifiable proof that you're on the left and therefore I can dismiss you. It's simply to assert that someone is on the left and therefore I can dis dismiss them. Um, and what's funny about this, and I'm sure, you know, people tuning in have seen this happen, uh, you know, at least sometimes in their life. If someone doesn't like you, even if you're the most arch conservative, most well-established conservative person in the world, there's some jerk out there who don't like your opinion on something. Suddenly you're woke. Suddenly, suddenly you're a lefty, um, if they don't like you. So, uh, and I'll get to how this tactic works on, 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 on the left as well. Then we talk about, you know, being able to dismiss experts, which we have some sympathy for because a lot of the book is explaining about how much experts have done to undermine their credibility. You can dismiss journalists as well, same, you know, but you, you don't dismiss all of them. And then of course, for the, the most hardcore that you can dismiss people who've previously said things um, negative about Donald Trump, for example, kind of like the MAGA exception. So we have three chapters on, on cancel culture from the right. Um, we have about 20 chapters on cancel culture more on the left. And we, I, I mentioned this distinction because we were called out in one review for uh, engaging in mindless both-siderism. It's like, no, if we're engaged in mindless both-siderism, we would have had equal number of chapters on each topic. We're, we're recognizing that cancel culture does exist on the right, but it's a more serious problem in academia, corporate world, all places that are dominated by the left. So uh, the perfect rhetorical fortress. Now the perfect rhetorical fortress is something I've been talking about since 2015, when I realized that people on my side of the spectrum, which is more I'm more left of center, um, the uh, who are um, you know obsessed with identity and how they're able to not address anyone's argument. And I, we call it perfect because it's invincible. It's just layer after layer after layer. And level one um, is dubbing someone conservative. Um, and I call this fascio casting more recently. I'm, I'm not sure that's the term I want to stick with, but I want to come up with something catchy to get, get this across that like, you know, magically casting someone as a fascist or a, or, or a, or a right winger or a conservative is the most common way to dismiss someone's opinion in most circles I see today. And again, go back to our great untruth. It doesn't it's it's a BS argument. Nobody should have taken this seriously in the first place, but it's been so successful. You shouldn't be surprised that there are now mind blowing law review articles published in prestigious journals that make the argument um, that the ACLU uh, and the um, uh, uh, and the New York Times are uh, neo Confederates, uh, by which they mean super right wingers or, or their dupes, um, basically because they've actually occasionally covered stories from uh, that give some credence to the fact that there's, you know, might be more to the trans issue, for example. 
Um, and that's a real sign that this tactic has worked so well, you're willing to use it on practically anybody because it just keeps working. We keep on rewarding it. So that's just level one. And you can basically get rid of 100% of people. And certainly if you use the other, if you use the, the obstacle course and the and the minefield, you're already got to 100% of the population ever lived. Then, but you're just getting started. There's 13 more steps. I'm not going to cover all of them. But we go through the demographic filter, which is essentially you can dismiss someone if they're white, you can dismiss someone if they're white, uh, you can dismiss someone if they're male, you can dismiss someone if they're not gay, you can dismiss someone if they're cisgendered. And you can certainly um, dismiss people if they're not any of the, anything that combines those intersections. And we worked out that that leaves about 0.8% of the population of the planet. But he, and so congratulations, you're, you're down to 99, point, you know, you got rid of 99.2% of the population. And that's before if so, figuring out someone's an expert in anything, if they're, if they're knowledgeable, uh, et cetera. Um, but here's the great thing about the demographic uh, funnel. Uh, by the time you get to the end of it, none of it mattered. It was just a time-wasting tactic. Because if you are a, a, a non-white um, trans person and you still think, you know, a, 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 a topic that is a sacred cow on the left is BS, uh, you, it's, it's going to be even worse for you because then you're accused of internalized transphobia, um, internalized uh, racism. Um, you might end up like Ricky, who, who is often accused of internalized misogyny, because, of course, how else could you explain it? Um, it, 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 and, uh, that, and that kind of shows how it's perfect. And then it's just layer after layer after that of other ways to dismiss people, other excuses to dismiss people, including, you know, focusing on someone getting angry. Um, and then the final two, which are, um, uh, uh, the first one is, uh, emotional blackmail, which is if nothing else work, come into someone's office crying. Um, this is what they tried to do to get uh, Jordan Peterson's uh, contract canceled um, at Penguin Canada, uh, that literally you had adults crying in order to like, how could we publish him? Um, and if you've ever been on the receiving end of you know someone in tears, that can be quite hard um, to say no. And then the final one, uh, the absolute kind of like, I guess we've lost, but there's still one thing to try, is darkly hint that something else is going on here. Uh, they did this to Nicholas Christakis. They do this over and over again, where essentially it's kind of like, the well, the real context, I can't really tell you what it is, but this person is actually evil, um, is, uh, you know, it just comes up over and over. So um, in order to illustrate all of these um, tactics working at the same time. We actually, we were getting pretty close to done, done with the book. The Stanford Law School shout down of Judge Kyle Duncan happens. That's my alma mater. Um, I'm still in very good touch with them. And I was disgusted at, um, at, at my school. Uh, and we use that as a way of showing all of the tactics at the same time um, at use, including the don't get angry tactic, which is one of the ones that really blows me away. Because when this happened, a number of people, including Jennifer Rubin, who continues to embarrass herself, who was an American Association of University professors uh, professor who wrote a book arguing for limiting academic freedom, even though she's an AAP professor, um, uh, in the name of uh, banning, adding a new exception, new teeny, teeny exception to, to freedom of speech and academic freedom, which is just banning anything that, that can be deemed white supremacy, which which of course means anything you want it to mean. Any 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 argument potentially can be white supremacy. So she mostly focused on the fact that Kyle Duncan got angry, and the the San Francisco Chronicle uh, made the argument that well he got what he wanted because um, uh, uh, because he got attention from it, but also he got angry, so he's, he was just as abusive to the students as he was to him. And of course, what they leave out is that right before he spoke, two students shouted at him, "I hope your daughters get raped." And I mean, it's and that was just the beginning of it. I mean, the one that offended me the most was people actually saying to a Fifth Circuit judge that you couldn't get into this school, you know, um, which is like, oh, great, elitist assholes. That's exactly like what we want people to think we're not. But then also there, there were tactics like someone asking about um, uh, having having sex with men and about how kind of like, well, anyway, sorry, that, that there was a lot of immature stuff going on. I realize I probably want to keep this G-rated. So you, you, you can uh, check out more material like in, in the book about that. So we use Stanford to illustrate like how all these can be used at the same time uh, in the book. Um, and so that's section two. I think it's some of the most interesting parts that we, we wrote. So it was probably where we have 
a little bit more fun um, than in some of the other more depressing parts of the book. But then we get to our recommendations for how to drag ourselves out of this thing. And I'll switch over to Ricky. Yeah, I think we're probably a little tight on time at this point, but I think that a, a broad overview, perhaps we can lean a, a little bit more into this with our conversation with George um, in terms of the particulars, but the places where we think there, the, um, there's just like the most ripe room for reform include um, raising kids who are not cancelers, which is a really important uh, conversation, in my opinion, as someone who pretty much only remembers the time frame of cancel culture. And I, I keep on mentioning, and it continues to surprise people that Gen Z has the most negative view of cancel culture of any generation, um, not because they understand free speech values and they're all such great champions of classical liberalism, but because they recognize that there's something very wrong with growing up and with tripwires all around you and, and a graceless society where you can't make a mistake. But the problem is that we've kind of failed to raise this next generation, um, myself included, with any of the old idioms that really met, made like America what America is or made any free society what it is, um, like to each their own and it's a free country and everyone's entitled to their own opinion, which feels very obvious to older generations. And yet I can say from firsthand experience that that's, I, I was told to, to trust my feelings and that I deserve to be safe and that I would need a trigger warning. Um, so it's pretty much just the opposite is how we're raising this next generation. Generation. Um, and then we also have pointers for, for corporations and how to keep um, the office out of the culture wars and how to deal with this new breed of Gen Z employees who want to see their uh, CEO scalp on the wall. Um, and then we have a bit on K-12 to as well in higher education. I don't know if, Greg, there's anything you want to uh, mention on those, but yeah. Uh when it comes to uh, higher education, um, certainly uh, I've been writing more uh, eternally radical idea about even bigger and bolder ideas for what needs to be done in higher ed, because I think that we need to be talking about very serious reform, including massively de-bureaucratizing. We also talk about this in the book, too. Like, I don't think there's any way through the current problem without massively de-bureaucratizing, particularly getting rid of the DEI apparatus. We need uh, fire put up model legislation to uh, fight DEI statements as political litmus tests, um, which is just, I think, a no-brainer, um, but still there's resistance to. Um, when it comes to what, where I think there really is a lot of hope for change, um, a, a big, the, um, uh, a lot of the small startups that people are doing right now, whether that's University of Austin or some of the stuff that Sal Khan, Khan Academy is working on, that's where I put a lot of my hope. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we need big, bold ideas for higher education reform and for even figuring out ways to sidestep the, the existing system entirely. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, George, I, I think you're, you're muted. There. There we go. Okay, I, I think it's time for some discussion. Let me ask, start by asking you this question. The two of you come from pretty far different points on the political compass. So how did that make this book go? Was it easier or harder? Because you, you disagree on some things, but obviously you can disagree on things in a mature way. And mm -hmm. the whole point of the book is we can't disagree with each other in civil fashion any longer. So. Uh, how was that dynamic between the two authors of this book? Well, uh, you know, I, it wasn't it wasn't bad at all. Um, we we have a great working relationship and always have the, the um, uh, and that part of that is that uh, Ricky, for a lot of her beliefs, would be you know like twenty five years ago would be center left. Um, like the, the there there are a lot of things that she kind of takes for granted that um uh that would be mainstream including her views on free speech and 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 other issues um that would be not considered all that conservative 25 years ago but we've seen this huge you know realignment the extent to which we do disagree about stuff we both believe in free speech we both like and trust each other so that makes you know that I, we we i don't think we ever really ran into any serious problem in that way R ricky did, did. 
Yeah, I think um, to to hop off of that point, and today in like modern academia, if you're not far left, you're alt right, and so I just kind <laughs> of supported myself into being like, I guess I'm I'm on the right. But I mean, I would I would say that both of us have some centrist tendencies, but also I would say that the fact that we came from differing parts of the political aisle, but definitely like if the right left binary doesn't line up, the liberal illiberal one certainly does. Yes. Um, and I think like being able to distill our book and, and to write it in a way that might appeal to people from across the aisle and also perhaps patch each other's blind spots a little bit um, mm. too was really, it was it actually, I think if anything, it was a, a benefit to the book because um, I, I, I don't want it to be a partisan exercise and free speech is not a partisan issue. And so I, I hope that our partnership uh, illustrates that fact. I think that's a really important point that the the true division in America these days, right and left, that doesn't mean much anymore. Mm -hmm. Liberal versus illiberal. Now that means a lot. Are you an authoritarian or are you willing to take a live and let live approach to life and politics and everything else? Well, let me ask you this next. Uh, in the past, college students were mostly very strong advocates of free speech. But today, many of them are eager to silence and punish anyone who says anything they disagree with. Now, how did this transformation come about? <laughs> Do you have uh, 18 hours? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I know you're good at condensing stuff. Right? I, I, yeah, no, I think I said Ricky's better than, than I am. Um, but uh, j just to say it as quickly as possible. One, we always have to remember that um, free speech being well respected as, as a bipartisan issue is not situation normal for most of human history. Um, that's something that I was lucky enough to grow up um, in a time where free speech was very well respected. But that's not that's why we call I, I call my pod uh, my my, my uh, the eternally radical idea my Substack the eternally radical idea because I think free speech is radical in every in, in every generation. Um, but. There's two forces that that um, really led to um, uh, this shift in the left. Uh, one was academia um, uh, and momentum that essentially like when something starts trending a little bit more in one partisan direction, it, uh, uh, forces take over and then you start attracting more people on your side and then you end up having sort of a runaway polarization effect that essentially and you get further and further and further in the direction of the majority of the group. Um, now, those are the kind of impersonal social science -y forces that a lot of books, um, the kind of books that I like and a lot of my own kind of um, background in, in, in social science actually gets me excited uh, as well. Um, so some of it are what I would call natural forces. Um, on the other side are very intentional, very pernicious forces. Um, and, you know, Herbert Marcuse, one year after the beginning of the free speech movement in 1964 in Berkeley, where, but or, as we all know, some of the people in that movement were not all that big on free speech. They're big on their own free speech, but some were very good, to be clear. Um, the But 1965, Herbert Marcuse writes this book that's still treated like it's brilliant when it's just making the incredibly primitive argument that... Um, Essentially, my people are good and enlightened and the so-called right wing, I mean, it's very clear that he just means conservatives, um, aren't and they're regressive and therefore a truly free society, a truly equal society would have talents for my side, but uh, dread powers over the, the regressives on the other side. Very primitive, very basic argument, but somehow taken seriously. Um, now, this wasn't taken that seriously on the left, that the kind of left that used to be the kind of one that I grew up in, which is the more libertarian kind of hippie kind of like, you know, leave, leave us alone kind yeah. of attitude. Um, and that was very popular when I was younger. But there was this left that was badly discredited by the fall of the Soviet Union, badly discredited for being so out of touch in the 80s, badly discredited by the political correctness movement um, and kind of a joke. And by the by the time the mid 90s came around, it was kind of sort of collectively agreed on that left was um foolishness uh but unfortunately uh it was agreed on the rest of american society not on campus and unfortunately uh when i started in 2001 the bad left uh was winning and unfortunately i feel like a lot of the the more liberal left um is is uh even though i think we're still numerically the majority when you look at the polling we're not the one we're not the powerful ones uh, on that side anymore and there's also just a tendency that once you're in power you know uh, when you're when you're the small minority 
um, then of course you believe in free speech because small minorities and the powerless need free speech because that's the only power they might have is their voice. Uh, but once you're in the majority, once you're making the rules, then this is just this is just limiting my power to I don't know squelch you. And I might just add that um, to the point that I made earlier about the lack of education on free speech values. It, it it's a very small sliver of human history. That in which we're not burning heretics at the stake and in, in which we're actually respecting free speech values. But if we fail to teach the next generation, then the, de the default is that they will tend towards censorship. Um, and I can say from my own experience, I did um, an accelerated two-year philosophy degree at NYU or a philosophy program there and ended up dropping out um, out of disillusionment. But over the course of the two years that I was there, I had never um, encountered like the philosophy of free speech or classical liberalism in any way, shape or form. And it actually took me dropping out during the pandemic and kind of stumbling upon John Stuart Mill's On Liberty to fully mm -hmm. understand the philosophical basis, which to anyone who is even vaguely informed um, and has not been in college in the 21st century, but perhaps before that, that seems like a very obvious thing that I should have been exposed to earlier. Um, but the fact that that was such an earth shattering idea to me, um, even as a voracious reader and um, and a, at the time more politically conservative as well, the fact that I just had never encountered that that philosophy, I think uh, goes to show just how how far we can drift if people just don't understand the values in the first place. Greg has debated people who downplay the phenomenon of cancel culture. That's a, was an interesting part of a chapter in the book. Well, what is their argument and how do you respond? Uh, level one, um, and this is also in the um, obstacle course um, uh, chapter, uh, and it's become a cliche, but a funny one. Um, this isn't happening at all. And then you provide enough evidence that it is happening. Oh, this is happening, but it's not happening a lot. And then you provide, and that's actually where a lot of the debate is right now. Um, and one of the reasons why we wrote the book is because there have been some other books written on cancel culture. They just didn't have a lot of data. Um, and fire, uh, coddling the American mind was great for fire because not only did it get us our name in front of a million uh, additional people, but more, um, the, uh, it uh, showed that having a research department at FIRE with lots of different social scientists was really necessary, having an interdisciplinary approach. And that's some of the coolest work we're doing, you know, today um, are thanks to these great researchers that, um, uh, that, that we that we have. And we were able to put them to good use to do massive polling. It's the stuff we use for our campus free speech ranking. If people on, on, on this call don't know about that, uh, we have this amazingly rigorous free speech ranking, which, by the way, um, Harvard finished dead last um, by our ranking this year. And it's not a subjective ranking. It's based on um, uh, the massive polling and databases of student cancellations, professor cancellations, deplatforming, and speech codes. Um, and they and Harvard really won its position on there. Um, University of Pennsylvania came in second to last. University of South Carolina came in third to last, by the way. So it's not it doesn't it doesn't always work out exactly like you'd think. And Georgetown fourth to last. Um, so in looking at that and uh, updating and uh, having done a couple surveys since then, what we established was one, um, almost 10% of students say that they have been investigated for speech or actually punished for speech on campus, like formally investigated. Now, I, people don't have a good grasp of numbers. They have a terrible grasp of history. And one in 10 is insane. Like that, that's not, you're not going to find numbers like that in a history of that many people, you know, um, being silenced in the United States, at least. Uh, that's, that's like a million people. Um, who have either been threatened with punishment or actually punished, um, or at least half a million actually punished. Um, completely nuts. Um, it's even worse, by the way, for professors, because one in six say that they were um, investigated or punished. And of course, of course that doesn't and couldn't count uh, people who've already been fired. Uh, be, uh, then we get to the no numbers we know about, which we also know is a massive undercount. I have something in Reason Magazine called the um, uh, called the the Conformity Gauntlet, which is an adaptation of the chapter that me and Ricky wrote, which um, <laughs> about all the different conformity inducing pressures that you have on an individual student, and it's depressing to read, but it's you know uh, nonetheless true. Um, and so the idea that they still find witches to burn at all 
is mind blowing. And we found about a thousand um, uh, professors targeted uh, since 2014 for punishment. And that's our official start date for cancel culture is 2014. When it comes to professors, it didn't really accelerate until around 2017. So that's overwhelmingly that 1,000 is just in the last, say, five years um, of, of cancel culture. So it's it, it's numbers unlike we've ever seen. Two-thirds um, of the 1,000 have been punished in some way, and about a fifth of those, uh, approaching 200, have been fired. And just to give some historical perspective here, that's twice as many um, as were fired during the Red Scare. There were about 62 to 63 communists fired during the Red Scare, like for being the Communist Party. So it's more than three times the amount of communists who were, who were fired uh, during the Red Scare. So you have to lay out all that data. Um, and I'm getting, it's hard to really, once you know it all, to say that this is no big deal. Um, so then the next step is saying, actually um it's the people who oppose this problem that are the that are the problem you know like you have to just shift the argument over to something else so uh we haven't uh, we've gotten to that with some people so far we're still kind of in the argument of having of, of, of establishing that this is real and serious and that was another thing that i did in the response to david cole um but uh yeah so you respond to them with data um and historical comparisons and there's no question if you're intellectually serious at all that something very scary has happened good bad ideas tend to spread and cancel culture clearly is no longer just an academic problem it's become part of the government's arsenal uh, as we saw with the uh, attempts to silence anyone who deviated from the approved line on covid policy so let's talk about that for a bit this is uh, this is Ricky. Good. Yeah. Um, well, to the the beginning of that question, I, we actually we refer to Richard Dawkins's concept of a meme with cancel culture because it's true that it replicates because it's it's so effective and it's much easier to tear down your opponent by calling them a cis white male than actually refuting their point. Um, but certainly, it's been it's been replicated on on the governmental level. I mean, we we talk uh, or I've spoken to Dr. Jay Bhattacharya um, about the fact that FOIA emails um, uncovered that Dr. Francis Collins in communications with um, Dr. Fauci uh, had called him a fringe epidemiologist and called for a swift and devastating takedown of his research um, as he was advocating for focus protection pretty early on in the pandemic. Um, and I think for for me, for Greg, for um, for many people, we really saw for the first time um, the the active suppression of of dissenters in an unfolding crisis at a point in time where if we'd actually had an honest conversation in the beginning and said we don't know everything but here's what we do know or here's what we think rather than having edicts coming from on high or mm -hmm. so-called noble lies um i think that we could have come out of the pandemic actually more unified because we'd come out of something that we'd fought together and we all grappled with the um the expanding and, and gradual development of knowledge on a novel disease but instead we had quite the opposite and just an epistemic disaster on our hands because consistently people did not know what to believe um, and people who dissented from the mainline position, many of whom were ultimately um, vindicated and some of whom were, were of course, fringy and, and saying things that turned out not to be true at all. But when there's no distinction between good faith actors who are just positing a, an alternative hypothesis and and somebody who's absolutely a kook who's saying something that's demonstrably untrue and we're tearing people down and not their ideas instead then i think that um that's precisely why we ended up having so many people whose eyes were opened to the problem of cancel culture at this point in time not to mention the fact that on campuses despite the fact that uh, there were shutdowns of, of campuses. Fire had the highest caseload that they had ever had in 2020 in terms of students and professors mm -hmm. reaching out because they've been targeted with cancel culture. There's a lot in the book that's pretty darn depressing, but maybe <laughs> the most depressing story of all is the story of Mike Adams. Oh. Um, who taught at UNC Wilmington. Some of our listeners may remember Mike Adams. Greg got to know him rather well. I, I let's let's go into that story a little bit. I think it's so revealing. Yeah, um, yeah. That one's you know that 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 one will never stop singing a little bit. You know, like the um, 
I wrote about this again, you know, I keep on mentioning my Substack, but I, I did an updated version of something that I wrote back in 2020 about this. Um, and it's become probably the most read thing on the website now. So I started uh, at fire back in, um, I actually landed in Philadelphia, um, to look for an apartment at nine, 10 AM on nine 11. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, and, and I, so I ended up being stuck in Philadelphia for a week because people, people, some people are too young to remember, including Ricky, um, air, airlines were shut down that entire week. Um, like you couldn't, I couldn't get home back to California where I lived at the time. And, uh, shortly thereafter, Mike had called out a student who wrote basically, I think maybe on the 11th, I think actually it might've been, uh, September 12th saying uh, to the entire university listserv that America had this coming because we're monsters and, you know, like we, we, chickens are coming on a roost kind of nonsense. And he wrote something back, you know, calling her out. And, and the most offensive thing he said was, listen, your speech is protected, um, just like bigoted and ignorant speech or, or so. I think if he actually even said ill-informed, he didn't, I don't even think he called her ignorant speech is, um, you know, it should be. Uh, but that was apparently the offensive thing that he said to the student that was not okay. Um, but the student started claiming that he was like orchestrating uh, harassment uh, of her. And so they looked into Mike. Adams's emails. And I was new to fire at the time. I was like, like I said, first legal director. And so I, I didn't have as much experience seeing cases. And I would say, given my career, this is like a four on the badness scale. I, I'm used to these days, just to give you an idea of how bad things have gotten since then. Um, this is not even that bad of a case in the grand scheme of things, but I was mad. I was really angry about this case. So Mike and I became friends pretty early on. Um, and I was reading a book called um, How to Talk Dirty and Influence People by Lenny Bruce. Uh, I recommended it to him. He And the, he then forever uh, attributed to me the idea that because he read that book, he realized that he was going to be an even more in-your-face kind of conservative activist, that he was going to be much more um, uh, jokey and irreverent in his, um, uh, in his columns. And so that meant we ended up having to defend him an awful lot. And, you know, I've come more from the left side of the spectrum. Um, he would write some articles and, with titles uh, and points that made me cringe sometimes. Um, but they're always jokey. And they're uh, they're always kind of like a lighthearted way in a way that's always accepted when people on the left do it. Um, and I got used to defending him. And he actually won a really important case for academic freedom for the entire country in the Fourth Circuit, um, Adam's case. And he made a joke in 2020 where a lot of these worst cases happened, um, where he likened um, lockdowns jokingly, very clearly jokingly, to slavery. Um, that essentially, like uh, he said, Massa, governor of North Carolina, whose name I've got, or South Carolina, whose name I've got to learn at some point, um, let my people go. So like a well, joke out of Ferris Bueller, for goodness sakes. Um, and he... Uh, students really flipped out. They started demanding he'd be fired. Um, he, they, uh, because he'd previously sued and won against the school, the school had to sign a severance agreement against him. Um, he got, you know, probably a fraction of the money he should have gotten. Um, and I talked to him since I thought he was going to be fine because he always just struck me as so self-confident. I, to my eternal shame, um, only contacted him a couple of weeks after he was already fired. I've already forced out. And he was not okay. He, um, uh, protesters were still coming to his house. Um, and uh, and he didn't sound okay. And he was asking me, like, what can you do legally? And I'm like, I'm sorry, you signed a severance agreement. There's not a lot you can do. And that's kind of the last thing I've said to him. Um, and he killed himself the next week. And that, he's not the only person I've known and and since every like I'm very open about my own psychological struggles in coddling the American mind, um, I can only tell you this part: everybody in the movement who's having a hard time has a tendency to come to me to confide in me to to say that they're having a hard time, and I love having that position um, uh, because I I helped out a lot of people in my life, um, and I know there of some other people who've killed themselves, and I'm quite sure that it was because of this environment. But as far mm -hmm. as like the most the one that was the most directly and most clear. It was cancel culture killed Mike. And um, yeah. Well, for the re remaining time we have, I think we'll go to some of the questions that have come in from our listeners. 
uh, here's the first one. What can be done to truly hold accountable and to make examples of those who are guilty of canceling unpopular voices and views, especially those voices and views coming from the socio-political right? Um, it's a little tough because we try to be pretty clear here that you have the right to call for someone to be punished and you have a right to call someone out ferociously and we and fire would stand up for your right to do that. It's incumbent on people in power to not give in to the, to people saying that. I think it's perfectly fine for a school to say, you know, um, when students were protesting Carol Hooven for saying, God forbid, mm -hmm. um, there are two biological sexes. Um, that what Harvard should have done there is actually go, no, um, we, we've we not taught you well that uh, you, you should be expected to be offended here and that you should be used to the idea that, that um, you're going to disagree with your professor sometimes and you don't flip out over it. Um, so I think that universities should be talking back, um, not punishing students for, for when they um, demand that someone be canceled. I think they should be you know, responding to them of why they should not be and be very clear and direct about it. However, a lot of students, and to be clear, this is all enabled by administrators, um, a subset of administrators, but a powerful subset of administrators. And they actually sometimes even put these things together. Those administrators should be fired, to be clear. Um, uh, and I think that they're, because as a threat to academic freedom and free speech on campus, um, the, 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 this is true of Yale, this is true of Harvard, this is true of Stanford, um, that these administrators need to go. Um, and when students go beyond, um, you know, mere, mere criticism or protected speech, when they're blocking people, shouting people down, um, they should be uh, punished. And I think in many cases, they should be expelled as well. And certainly if it involves violence at all, they should be expelled. Um, another question. For public universities, how do you feel about legislatures and governors trying to lead reform on DEI and grievance studies? If it's grievance studies at public universities, then that runs into serious academic freedom, First Amendment issues that essentially they're, they're saying that a like so the stop woke act um i know that there are probably people on this call that were highly sympathetic to this um in florida it was unquestionably extremely unconstitutional because like they actually had to go into court uh, the the state of florida had to go into court and make the argument that under this act uh, a professor could argue against affirmative action but they couldn't argue for it and it's like as soon as you've admitted that you're basically saying this is laughably unconstitutional. We and we told the governor that from the beginning. We told everybody that. And then, of course, when it came up, should be no surprise. Fire is genuinely nonpartisan. We took it to court and we won. Uh, and I believe that we'll win again. However, um, if a school is saying that we're going to limit the number of majors we offer, and we're like, say, let's say I think some of these schools should be only should. I, I honestly, this is how, this is how radical I've got. I think some schools should be going, should be breaking off their science schools because the rot is so bad. Um, and that mm -hmm. if a school is like, listen, we're just uh, we're, we're just offering hard science majors from now on, um, and that completely getting rid of some of the grievance study stuff, including you know some of the other departments, they have every right to do that. Um, and when it comes to getting rid of administrators, um, they can get rid of administrators. Um, and I've I've been a little bit embarrassed for some people on who I normally agree with who will point out. Um, they'll they'll criticize the Stop Woke Act. I'm like, okay, I agree with you on that. And then they'll talk about and these other policies that say you have to get rid of your DEI administration. And I'm like, uh, uh, staffers who are threats to academic freedom. And I always point out, like, you have to you, you should say in the same breath that oh, but academic but academic freedom is threatened by these administrators routinely. So you need to, like getting rid of them is like saying oh, we have a free speech right to have our censorship police, which is exactly what it's saying. So yes. I, de de bureaucratizing I think is a great idea. R Ricky, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just um, add on this front that I this is a, a place where I'm, I'm definitely calling out my own side frequently, where I feel like there is a tendency to fight cancel culture with more cancel culture or a liberalism with more liberalism. Um, and I'm oftentimes sympathetic to the impetus to do so or, or the underlying beliefs. But I think the tactics have really gone awry in some uh, portions of the right wing where it's fighting might with might in, a, in an unhealthy way that's not sustainable and does not actually get to the root. Uh, cause, which, which in in my view is is our alienation of a free speech culture in society right now. 
Okay. Uh, another question. This relates to a recent event at UNC. Last week, members of UNC Chapel Hill chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine protested a joint appearance on campus by Barry Weiss and Frank Bruni, attempting to shout down Weiss in particular. Provost Chris Clemens, who founded Carolina's program for public discourse, which also the talk was not having it, he stood and interjected immediately that state law forbids the heckler's veto and requires the university to protect the rights of speakers to be heard and attendees to hear and see the event. Clemens announced firmly, you are not allowed to disrupt this event. You will need to leave. You will need to leave now. Order was restored quickly and the hecklers ejected. Weiss and Bruni continued their discussion and debate. UNC Chapel Hill is an emerging national leader in the freedoms of speech, thought, and academic inquiry. Why are so few other universities following Carolina's admirable lead, especially public schools supported by taxpayers and accountable to the citizenry? Uh, his name is Clemens, right? Yeah, uh, the, Clemens. Yep, I, I I know him and he's great and I, and good good, for, good good on him for that. Um, one of the okay, there's a couple different reasons why I think UNC is a little bit better of environment to begin with. One of them is, and here's where I'm Ricky can attest. I'm obsessed with class, and I actually think an awful lot of the um, uh, the culture war is actually about economic class in, in a way that uh, a lot of the people, you know, a lot of the Harvard grads don't like to admit um, that, that, that a lot of those issues are actually more about economic class. And I think that UNC, Chapel Hill, um, and a lot of public schools, because they have a better balance of people who aren't just from the weird blue bubble at the top of the economic distribution, tend to be a little bit more grounded. And I think that actually makes a big difference in terms of the political climate that you have. Um, so I've actually generally enjoyed going to UNC, Chapel Hill in a way that I have not enjoyed going to Duke. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, another thing is having the support of your um, uh, board of overseers, um, uh, and having, ha having some support in the larger environment. So I think that people in this case, the idea of them getting in trouble, the, those students getting in trouble was a more credible threat than it would be at a school that was completely in the tank for any pro-Palestinian protester that they ran into. And that's one of the, one of the problems that people don't entirely get that the pro-Palestinian standpoint, it's a very popular standpoint, particularly in elite colleges and, and, and schools in California. And they get, and they're allowed to get away with a lot of stuff that isn't protected and that shouldn't be, um, including shout, things like shout downs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we're, we're getting low on time and my computer is low on power, but I think we have time for a little bit more. Okay. Um, here's a question. Any thoughts on ways to improve K-12 schooling to help build a free speech culture? What do you think, Reggie? Yeah, I mean, I think that teaching the lessons of, of classical liberalism and free speech and not taking for granted the fact that they are in lessons is very important. I'm also a huge advocate for civics education. That's something that was really glossed over in, in my own education. Um, even though I'd gone to great private schools, I've just, I was woefully um, un, uninformed. And we know that less than a quarter of eighth graders are proficient in civics and in U.S. history for that matter. Um, so I think that emphasizing those, um, those particular fields of study at a younger age is really important. Um, and also, I think uh, we we definitely talk about the anti-bullying movement and some of its excesses as well and pulling away from the idea that there is just good and bad in, in terms of interpersonal co uh, conflict. Um, and kind of, I think that sort of binary and some of the excessive anti-bullying uh, kind of monitoring of children and not allowing them to have as many uh, disagreements without a, a third party or an adult getting involved and and kind of like bringing down the gavel on someone, I think is a, a healthier uh, a track for K to 12 as well. Yeah, and I, I wrote something called the empowering of the American mind, which is a list of principles um, for, uh, whereas I think a lot of um, reforms for K through 12 uh, curriculum on the right have come uh, on like, what stuff should we ban and what stuff should we get rid of? I think it's always more effective to have a positive vision of what you would want that is incompatible, say, with identity politics um, and principles that are bigger and more inspiring and that actually that, you, that are, are mutually exclusive. 
Um, so we, we tried to boil down the empowering of the American mind in canceling of the American mind in a in, in a, a very quick, easy to read way. But I'm planning to re-up that whole list and probably maybe even get it. It's it's nine principles might add a tenth, um, and to, to have that up on 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 my uh, Substack at, at some point because I I do think that people want to know what they should be for rather than just against. Okay, perhaps we have time for one more question. I hope my battery has time for this too. Uh, on my campus, UNC, a constant refrain is that conservative students self-censor simply because they are losing the intellectual debate and that their ideas shouldn't be welcome on campus anyway. How can we convince those kinds of people that free speech is an essential principle? What do you think, Ricky? Um, I mean, I can definitely say being more right leaning at NYU, I was self censoring. I think this is um, true and pervasive. And as soon as I started writing about um, issues of free speech on campus and op eds in the New York Post, I was like literally inundated with people in my DMs or in um, it was sending me emails, finding me in the school directory saying, I completely agree with you, but just let's just don't tell anyone that we had this conversation. And then people that I had interacted with in my day-to-day -day life um, frequently at NYU, who I never would have known, um, shared some of my concerns about campus culture, if not for having put myself out there in the first place. Um, so there is, I think, um, a, a truth in the idea that there, that courage is contagious, but also that cancel culture really thrives by making people feel alone. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think there's a, a role for professors uh, in particular to emphasize devil's advocacy and the idea that even if you do toss a, a, a belief out there that you might might be still kind of half-baked or might not even be your own, that that isn't necessarily something to attach to the person um, is helpful in the, the campus setting. But then I also think it's it, it there is a strength in numbers and it is a matter of more people coming out and calling out the problems that they see and not being afraid of the consequences, which I am a little bit heartened that I've seen more of that in, in recent history. Um, but certainly, I think that self-censorship is, is pervasive and, and massive on campuses, and particularly on the right, for sure. Uh, perhaps we have time for one more. No. How do we build the base where the left and the right learn to respect each other and stand up for each other's rights to be heard? Oof. Um... <laughs> I am going to declare my, uh, I already have actually decided that my book for the month um, is uh, The Fourth Turning is Here, which um, before I read it, I assumed it was some kind of like quasi mystical BS type stuff that I wouldn't be that into instead of a deeply erudite uh, theory of, of um, some tendencies that tend to repeat in history. I think we are coming towards something that's going to be pretty big and pretty ugly. Um, and I think that I've been saying, Height and I have been saying this for a while, that we think things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Um, so I think that everything is going to be in flux um, in, in, in big ways in the next 10 years. Um, and I think that there is real possibility for uh, teaching that way, but probably not before um, the crisis gets worse. Um, unfortunately, not to leave everybody on such a down note. I will say this, though, in times of crisis and people have said, oh, everything's at stake. So so we have to give up on freedom of speech um, because it's too, you know, it's too important. We have to we have to own the libs or own, own the right wingers. No, when things are in crisis, the battle rules and the rules of the Constitution become more important, not less. So please consider supporting fire uh, the fire dot org. A good way to end. <laughs> Support fire. And the Martin Center, too. We've been in the league yes. for forever. Yeah. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. And I thank uh, you, Greg, and I thank you, Ricky. And I will encourage all the people who've been enjoying our webinar to get a hold of Canceling the American Mind. It's an excellent, excellent read and a, a good conversation starter. <laughs>